and welcome. Thanks for joining us this Thursday evening. I'm Dr. Zarina Begg. I'm the Vale of Trent Faculty Educational Lead and it's been my great pleasure to bring these series of events to you along in collaboration with the Nottinghamshire GP Phoenix Programme and the GP Task Force Derbyshire Programme. Um, this is a third um, event in a series of events from ST to GP. Our first two events can be found on um, YouTube. Um, we'll pop the link up in the chat box. Um, tonight's event is all about navigating appraisals and we hope to shed some light on appraisals and hopefully make them not as terrifying as they might first appear to be. Okay, so we've got a great evening lined up for you and we've got lots of experts and um, together we hope to try and maybe uh, change that Mentimeter picture. So let me introduce to you our first speaker, Claire Gooder. Um, after spending time as an accountant and auditor, Claire joined the NHS, becoming an appraisal and revalidation manager seven years ago. Initially, she managed the Staffordshire and Shropshire region, but now she covers, are you ready for it, Staffordshire, Shropshire, Herefordshire, Worcestershire, Birmingham, Solihull and the Black Country, as well as Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. So I'll hand over to you, Claire, to give us an update about appraisals. Thanks, Zarina. Right, um, I'm going to share my screen um, make sure that you can see. I hope. Oh, there we go. OK, so I'm hoping that everybody can see that. So um, this is what I'm hoping by the end of today's session you'll be you'll be able to, to understand. So what you need to do as a, as a doctor, uh, what we do for you, um, and also understand the recent changes as well that have been brought about due to COVID. So who am I just to just to get that kicked off? So I'm Claire Gooder, Appraisal Room Validation Manager. Um, I work for NHS England. Uh, covering Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, that is part of NHS Midlands, and in turn, that's part of NHS England. This really is a whistle stop tour, and um, so I've got 15 minutes with you. Um, I have actually done uh, two hour lectures on appraisal and revalidation, so uh, you're probably thinking that you're quite lucky at the moment. Um, but what that means is that I have made quite a few uh, assumptions that you know a fair bit about appraisal and revalidation already and know that you've got some really interesting stuff coming up later as well that will answer a lot of the stuff that, that I haven't got in this. Um, but what I hope is that you will take away from, from my session is to contact us in the appraisal and revalidation team. Um, I've got my contact details there so we've got a, a team email address so you can get any one of us at any time on that and the, the number underneath is my personal telephone number. So um, yeah, takeaway message, definitely contact us if you've got any issues. So what I'll do is I'll just start with, the, with some basics really. So um, your designated body, if you're working in Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire is NHS England, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. Your responsible officer is Dr. Dave Briggs. And he's actually responsible for your appraisal, your revalidation, and also if you've got any GP performance concerns as well. A couple of things to remember is that your GP work takes precedent over all other work that you do. Uh, a couple of, of exceptions to that are if you're employed in the armed forces or you're still studying in some capacity. Um, but basically, if you're doing one session as a GP and seven sessions in secondary care or somewhere else, your GP work still takes precedent and that will be where your appraisal and revalidation sits. Also, where you're working for the majority of your time dictates who is responsible for you. So whilst you're in Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, we're responsible for you. If you move elsewhere in the country, your designated body will change. So um, always worth remembering those two points. So this is, is really directed at those that are ST3s at the moment or have just qualified. So the most important thing that you need to do is to change your status on the PCSE portal. So PCSE manages the performer list. It could very well be that that may take some time to actually work through. And if it is, and say you're working as a locum, 
and you're finding it difficult to get work because uh, your status is incorrect on the perform list, we can always give you a covering letter to make sure that uh, you can show that to employers. The next most important thing is that you let contact us and let us know that you've changed status, that you've qualified. You may very well think that PCSE would let us know. That is not the case. Um, and you could actually um, be flying under the radar for quite some time before we pick up by some other means. So do get in contact with us, let us know. What we'll do then is we'll set up your appraisal record. Um, that means that uh, we'll set an appraisal for you. It will be between six and 12 months post CCT and it will not always be in your birth month. So please don't assume that it will be. Um, then what we'll say is that you really should start to prep for your appraisal right from day one. Um, I know at the moment that that's difficult, um, but you need in some way just to be keeping a log of what you're doing. So CPD and any anything else that you're doing. The other thing to remember is PDP as well. We get a lot of first time uh, doctors coming to the appraisal saying that they haven't got a PDP. When you finish training, you'll probably come out with some sort of action plan and that can feed into your PDP for your first year. And the other thing to remember is that generally your first revalidation date will be around the same sort of time as your CCT. Try and get and try and contact Health Education England, your deanery, and get them to do the revalidation before you change your designated body over to Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. It'll mean that we've then got a full five years with you. So just moving on to a few odds and ends about appraisal. So just talking about guidance. So the GMC sets the guidance for all doctors in the UK. It's generic to all doctors. Doesn't matter whether you're in primary care, secondary care, working in a hospice, whatever. Um, it's exactly the same. The RCGP then publishes speciality specific guidance for GPs and the RO interprets, the responsible officer interprets what is expected locally. He can also, or he or she can also um, ask for local requirements to be set. And in our area, one of the local requirements is that your MSF, your colleague survey and your PSQ, your patient survey are benchmarked. Um, so, as you know, appraisal completed annually, it covers your whole scope of work. So your GP um, appraisal will cover any other work that you do and you'll bring all your other bits and pieces to that appraisal. Generic and applicable to all GPs, regardless of your status, your role, how many sessions you do. There's no differentiation. Um, as I say, under normal circumstances, you'll be putting together a portfolio of evidence and supporting information. At the moment, we know that that's difficult. Um, if nothing else, then uh, just keep a log of what you're doing just so that it will be ready for a discussion. It is supposed to be formative. It is not supposed to be a tick box exercise. Um, and it is supposed to be all about you and what's important to you. So in 2018, we did have an appraisal soft reboot, and that was really to tackle the burden of appraisal preparation. And what it did was reduce the written reflection that you had to provide. 2020 and uh, the COVID situation that we've got has again altered the format of appraisal um, and again made it a lot simpler. And I just want to spend a, a little while talking about that really. So appraisal 2020, um, it now is, and really it has always been, should be focused on you and your well-being. Um, it should be positive and it should be supportive. And we've made sure that all of our appraisers have received the training to make sure that that is how they're doing appraisals. It's really an approach that we've been um, working towards for a long time, but it is actually now um, put out there nationally that this is how it should be. It's actually a far more flexible approach than was previously. So you can fill in, if you want to, uh, a very short uh, page, single page template, it takes about 30 minutes, and you use that in conjunction with your toolkit, or you can just carry on using your toolkit as you've always done before. At the moment, there's no need to collect or provide supporting information. You'll just have a discussion with your appraiser um, about what's been going on with you, what's uh, how you found working through COVID. Um, you will need to talk about 
your training, you will need to talk about anything else that's been going on, but you don't have to collect it and provide it beforehand. You can if you want to, though, if you've already been collecting it and uploading it, and lots of doctors have been, just present that in the normal way. There is no need to count CPD. Um, and that is going to be something that is going to uh, continue going forward. So previously, you had to have 250 CPD over your revalidation period, um, 50 CPD each year. That is no longer the case. You just need to provide sufficient CPD um, to show that you are staying up to date. Um, at the moment, um, appraisals cannot be completed face to face. They have to be completed by, by a virtual platform. And there are a heck of a lot of resources and templates out there. Um, and there is the, the link for it. But if you, you go onto the AOMRC website, you'll be able to see all of that information. So just a few practicalities. So as I said, let the appraisal team know, let us know when you qualify. Um, you need to set up your appraisal toolkit. In our area, there are four and they're there. And I know that you, you've got a session on that later. Know what the GMC, RCGP and RO requirements are. Um, and also one important number to remember is that you are required to complete 40 UK NHS GP sessions. So if you are completing less than 40, if you're working outside the UK, if you're doing only private work, if you're not working as a GP, then you need to let us know because that will impact on your position on the form list and also the appraisal and revalidation that you complete. So a few more practicalities. Know when your appraisal month is, as I said, that's allocated by us and it doesn't change unless for some reason you have a postponement. Populate your toolkit throughout the year, normally. So as a minimum, just keep a log of what you're doing at the moment. Contact your appraiser to arrange your appraisal early. We will be telling you who your appraiser is in plenty of time. Submit your appraisal evidence two weeks before your appraisal. Watch out for communications from us. We will bombard you with reminders until we get a date onto our system. They're all automated reminders. Um, keep your appraisal team informed and up to date. So if you've got a problem, if anything's going wrong, anything happening, then let us know. Once you've had your appraisal, sign it off within 28 days. And probably one of the most important bits for us is you will get a link to fill in feedback survey. So how is the appraisal for you? Um, and just fill it in, it takes a couple of minutes, but what it does is it helps us with our training going forwards. Good reflection is essential. So you can do that, answer the three questions, what, so what, and what next, and your appraiser will be able to help you with that if you're not sure about it. Always remember confidentiality and anonymize what's in there. Make sure that you know your revalidation date and that you're working towards it. And a big plea from me, please don't leave your surveys until the last year of your revalidation cycle. It can get you into, into a bit of a, a mess, really, and it, it might mean that we need to defer you. So just a, a quick uh, little bit about revalidation. So generally, it's a five-year cycle, but not always. Um, it can be more or less than five years, and, of course, you might do more, you might do more or, or less than five appraisals in that cycle because of mat leave, sick leave, anything like that. The RO considers uh, what information you've provided in your annual appraisals, as well as having a look at our local governance systems to see if there are any open concerns, anything like that. And then the RO can make a recommendation to the GMC, either a positive recommendation if everything's fine, a deferral recommendation if there's something missing, like a survey, or if there's an ongoing process. It's normally a neutral act, but if he has to, if the RO has to uh, defer for a second time, uh, for the same reason, then the GMC does tend to get interested in, in why you've not made any sort of progress. And then, of course, there is the non-engagement recommendation. Very rare that we have to use that. So, but that really is if you're not doing anything at all. And then the GMC has a look at all that information and they decide whether to renew your license to practice. So just uh, moving on to what else do we as an appraisal and revalidation team do for you? So we answer your questions, we sort out your problems, but pre please only appraisal and revalidation uh, problems. We're not much good, good with anything else. Uh, we keep you up to date. We send out uh, an annual RO letter. We let you know if there are any changes to GMC, RCGP guidance, send out newsletters regularly, 
and we keep our appraisers trained and up to date as well. During your career, you will have loads of changes and, and that's just a, a small uh, number of things that might happen and who you might need to let know. The common denominator through all of that is the appraisal team. Um, if you let us know, we can always guide you to who else you should be informing. But uh, if you let us know, then it's, it's a good starting point. So lots of whatever's happening with you, let us know. You can get more information from loads of places, GNCRC, GP, NHS, England websites. There's a load of reading that you can do as well. Uh, and it's always worth just keeping up to date with, with exactly what the recommendations and the requirements are. Um, so where you can get more help and support. So like I said, that is our team email address and my phone number. Uh, we've got appraisal leads and Angela Sharman, who's speaking later. She's one of our leads and um, can always get help and support from them. Your appraiser will always be there to answer your questions. I put colleagues in there because, yet yeah, they will be able to help and support you. But please be careful. Um, some of their experiences may sound the same as yours, but may not be exactly the same. I've also put PSE, PCSE's um, email address in there and the link for the PCSE portal where you can change and check your details. And I would really recommend that you do go on and just check your details. It's surprising how um, wrong some of those can be. So please do check them. And I've also put in there a professional regulations team as well. So if you've got a, a complaint that comes directly through to NHS England or through the GMC, then it will be that team that will be in touch with you and uh, offer you support through that as well. But your takeaway messages from, from me, um, as I said, uh, keep the appraisal team updated on any changes, problems, anything else that's going on with you. And just remember that this is your appraisal. It is about you and it's for you. It really should be concentrated on your well-being and development so that you can talk through your problems, what's going on at work. It gives you a little bit of headspace, a little bit of time out um, and allows for that reflection and feedback. And yeah, the most important message really is that you only get out of appraisal what you put into it. And that's me finished. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, that was really a, a fantastic condensed summary of the appraisal and revalidation process. Um, so, so well done. You don't need to spend an hour on it anymore <laughs> or several hours. Um, but I think your last line, absolutely, you get out of it what you put in is, is really true for appraisals. OK, so next up we have Dr. Hussein Gandhi, uh, better known as Dr. Gandalf. He's going to be telling us about the different toolkits that are available and give you some advice about how to uh, go about assessing them and choosing which one's right for you. Um, Dr. Gandhi is a GP, a trainer. He's a member of the National RCGP Council. He's a treasurer of GP survival and a clinical director of Nottingham City PCN, where he's also a digital lead. He's also the founder of the EGP Learning Platform, which includes a website, a podcast and a YouTube channel. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely I would suggest you do. And he holds other various roles, including supporting clinicians with technology enhanced primary care and learning. So I'll hand over to you, Dr. Gandalf. Thank you, Zarina. I uh, hope you're all ready for a whistle stop tour of the various different um, portfolios that are around. Um, and yeah, we're going to get straight into it. So I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully you guys can see this nice and easy. And share. So hopefully you can see the slides there. Um, and I will just crack on. And I just need to move that so I can actually control it. There we go. So. Um, I'm going to give you a guide of the various different appraisal toolkits that exist. Um, just a slight declaration of interest. Uh, one of the things I'm going to mention is something called Digitalis, and I am actually a shareholder of Digitalis. Not a big one. I think I have two shares or whatever out of God knows how many, but just to be clear on that point. Um, and this is what I'm hoping to cover in, in this session. So I'm going to briefly talk about why you should use a toolkit and what the benefits are. Talk about very briefly the current appraisal. Um, I think Claire's done a much better job of it than me. And I know that Angela will also cover it in a lot more detail probably than I ever could. Um, I'm going to talk about your options when it comes to using toolkits. 
and a brief element of comparison, trying to help you understand which ones you may want to consider using. And then just because I like to offer tech tips, I'm gonna use some little tips in terms of how you can use technology to enhance the way that you do your appraisal a little bit. So why should you use a toolkit? Well, it's one of the best ways of storing all the evidence that you've got because the old fashioned way used to be pen, paper. And the problem with that is what happens if you lose the paper? Um, well, that's a problem. It's a lot harder to copy paper documents and that kind of thing. Um, and also actually a toolkit will help structure what you need to document a lot more effectively. So if we go back um, pre-COVID, you know, there was potentially a lot of information you needed to have in various different sections and things. And the toolkits allowed you to do that. It was also accessible wherever you've got an internet interface, which for most people, that's normally not a problem, particularly the GPs, because when we sit in front of desks all the time, desktop computers and that kind of stuff, actually not a real challenge. And it also allows you to sort out some of the assessments and, and that kind of stuff. And it is a form of an assessment. Um, it may be formative um, and obviously revalidation in a sense is summative, but having the access and the ability to do all that assessment easily and effectively. And many of the trainees will know how that works with the e-portfolios that they use for the training side. Current appraisal. So the current appraisal system we have at this moment in time is considerably less onerous in terms of the amount of information you need to present. It's effectively a formative chat talking about your well-being and focusing on that. Um, and that's what we have for now. If you wanted some information, a bit more detail about what it looks like before, um, probably listen to Claire. She's really good at that information. Um, alternately, you can have a look at this video that was commissioned by the GP Task Force last year that talks about appraisal in more detail. Obviously, some of that information may now but not be relevant for today. Anyway, let's get straight into the toolkits that are around. So there are a variety of toolkits you can use in England. And since we're in England, I'm going to focus on those ones that we have here. But uh, admittedly, Scotland has its own separate kind of toolkit that they potentially use. Um, the ones that we have access to. So in terms of companies that provide the toolkits, there's um, a few. Um, and you probably come across these names. So there's a Clarity Toolkit, uh, GP Tools, 14 Fish. There's something called the mag form. I'm going to talk about that. And there's the option of using other kind of things like notepads. And there's even a toolkit by the GMC if you wish to use it. I'm not going to cover that one, though. So the Clarity Toolkit. This is one of the most well-known toolkits that exist. Um, and part of this is because of a variety of reasons. So um, those of you that have been in general practice for more than about six years may remember that the RCGP actually had uh, the original appraisal and revalidation toolkit, but then actually the RCGP stopped commissioning that and they trans did a bulk transfer of their current um, database over to Clarity because at the time that was felt to be the most um, effective toolkit around. And uh, as a result of that, a lot of GPs do use the Clarity toolkit. Um, it has a lot of options that you can use, and particularly some of the, the kind of components within it are really effective. So there's things like Bluestream uh, training that many people may use, TeamNet, which particularly in the Nottinghamshire area is a massive thing that's being used, and it also links quite well with other companies, so things like MB Medical and Digitalis, which I'll come to in a bit later. Um, People always ask about the cost. So I'm actually going to cover the cost of the different toolkits. Um, and you can see it on the on the slide there. So the Clarity Toolkit costs £46.87 if you go without any of the discounts that you may have had from the RCGP days. And those a lot of those, I think, are due to finish this year, if I remember rightly. Um, or you can have their higher level version of it, so where you get the toolkit plus a learning environment, and, and that costs you £87.50 for 50 plus fat. It's important to know that they do also charge um, if you do the PSQ. So if you were to print the PSQ yourself, it will cost you £20, £8 plus fat. If you were to have um, Clarity print it off for you, send it to you so you don't have to do anything apart from give it to the patients, then that's £35 plus fat that you have to pay. The MSF is electronic, um, so they don't have the facility for you to do that as a printed version. GP Tools. So GP Tools is one of the toolkits many people may not have heard of. It's one of the lesser known ones. Um, and it was created a similar time as actually the others. Um, and it's a pretty interesting one. Um, it allows you to do lots of different things um, that many of the other toolkits have now caught up with. Um, and it has a lot of smart web features. So it allows you to do things like use bookmarklets. So that's a technology whereby you can click a button and save a particular website that you're browsing straight into your toolkit and then allow you to add your reflections and that kind of stuff straight into it. 
Um, and it was one of the first ones to have an app as well. Um, it's got a very simple interface. And I must admit, one of the, the feedback I've had is generally appraisers are less keen on using it because it's a little bit more clunky compared to the others when it comes to the aesthetics. So particularly from that point of view, I may be told otherwise. I know we've got some appraisers on here, but that's the information I've had from my appraisers when we've talked about it. Cost-wise, it costs £39 per year or £39.99 per year. And the PSQ and MSFs are free within that. 14 fish. So many people are going to learn about 14 fish. And I guess a lot of the trainees here are going to know about 14 fish because not only is it an appraisal toolkit, it is now also the trainee, the, the company that provides the trainee toolkit as well. Um, and it's got a really good smart interface. Um, as Arena mentioned, I'm a trainer. Uh, getting to grips with using it with my trainees, it's definitely a massive improvement compared to the training portfolio that we used to have before in terms of what you can do and how easily it presents the information. And a lot of that does translocate over to the, the appraisal toolkit because that's where they've got a lot of their skills and, and understanding from. It is very user friendly and it has a few extra features that make it quite useful. So it's got things like its own learning community that it has built into the, um, the appraisal toolkit, um, as well as other kind of things like AKT and CSA kind of stuff, as well as other um, components. Cost-wise, it's £42 per year. Um, and they do charge if you want to do the PSQ, so it's £28 per year. And I think they also charge for the MSF if you want a paper version of it as well. Um, it does also have other integrations. So it does integrate with other kind of platforms similar to what Clarity does. So things like Red Whale, um, one of the educational providers, as well as My Locum Manager uh, as well. So particularly if you're locuming, it has, there's additional discounts you can get through using those companies. The mag form. So the mag form is less well known by many people because it is not essentially an e-portfolio. It is a smart PDF. So it's one of the, you know, many people have used PDFs. It's basically a document that expands to allow you to document the information that you need for your appraisal. Um, it is free. You don't have to pay a penny. And that's probably one of its key features. Um, but you do, if you use the MAG form, have to find someone that will do your PSQ. And particularly, uh, as mentioned earlier, in our local area, it needs to be a validated format. There are a couple of companies that provide that. Um, but I, I'm afraid you need to look into that into a little bit more detail. I remember a company called Edge, and I think there's another one off the top of my head. If you are going to use the MAG form, the absolute must, I would say to anybody, if you're going to do, use it, is to make sure you store it on the cloud. So whether you use something like Google Drive or whether you use um, uh, Microsoft or One um, um, Drive, uh, oh, mine's gone, uh, the Microsoft environment or, or something else. And the main reason for that is then you can at least access it wherever you are. Um, I've had colleagues where they would keep the MAG form simply on their computer at home. And then the only time they could input that information was at home on their computer. That's fine if that works well for your well-being and your, the way that you do things. But generally speaking, if you want to capture, you know, art, you know, de novo learning and that kind of stuff, it's better to have access to it when you kind of want to have access to it, not when you, sorry, when you need to have access to it, not when you just want to have access to it. And I guess the key thing, it doesn't really work very well on a mobile device. Trying to edit a smart PDF on your phone is a real challenge because of the screen estate that you have. So um, there is that added element that it's not anywhere near as mobile, uh, obviously, for that same reason. An alternate method that I do sometimes suggest to people that they can use to enhance how they use portfolios is to simply use a notepad. Um, and this can be useful for two reasons. Number one, you don't have to worry about logging into the, the, the toolkits and having to stick to the structure of the information that you need to put in immediately. Um, but also you can make those notes for the learning in the way that actually I would hope many of us do it in terms of trying to understand the learning itself. You can then create that into an environment that can cross-reference information. So if you're to use things like Google Drive or Evernote, you can have tags and categories that allow you to search information quickly and effectively. And the search capabilities of these platforms is far superior to those in our e-portfolios. So you're creating your own knowledge repository as well as somewhere to store the information you then just simply copy and paste into the toolkits. And that's often what I've done with my learning. So if, for example, I was to go to a practice learning event, um, I would document my notes in a, a notepad, um, and then I would send the link of that to my e-portfolio, um, and then simply add my reflections on top of that, and provides my evidence, provides my learning, it provides my reflections. 
It's a balance of work versus convenience, though, because some people would say, why duplicate if you don't need to? So let's have a look. How would you choose? Um, people ask me this all the time. And, and these are the three things I come up with that will help you figure out what works best for you. And this is the important thing. It's important you use one that works best for you. So first and foremost, are you willing to pay for an e-portfolio and have an easier life? If the answer is no, go with the mag form. It's completely free. don't have to pay for anything. But I do feel that smart PDFs, although they are smart, they're not the best way of trying to document and keep a track of all this kind of information that you need to do so because it requires more organization on your behalf. It requires more effort on your behalf in order to do so. But it works for some people. If you use things like TeamNet and Bluestream at work and they're provided for you and you document a lot of your learning through that, that's probably the next thing to consider because if that's the case, then the Clarity Toolkit may be more effective because of that automatic integration, particularly with things like TeamNet, that learning that you can have, you can automatically integrate into your Clarity TeamNet and as a result of that, sorry, your Clarity Toolkit, and as a result of that, make that part of your workload and particularly the learning you get in practice a bit easier. However, one of the things I do recommend to anybody when they do use the Clarity Toolkit, um, the Digitalis app is actually a better way of using it. Um, I say that both as a user, um, so when I used to use the Clarity Toolkit, um, but it's just got more options in terms of letting you input data into the Clarity system because it integrates quite clearly with it. And then lastly, um, if you feel that actually that's not the best option, then it comes down to the question of which one's more important to you money or aesthetics. And the reason why I say that, both GP Tools and 14 Fish are excellent toolkits. GP Tools is cheaper, but the aesthetics of it are not as pretty and not as user-friendly as 14 Fish. So that's your choice then that you come to at that point. And there you go. That's how you can help figure out which toolkit will work best for you. If you want an absolute comparison, that's all of it on a table if you want to. I've even stuck the GMC one in there, but I haven't gone into that into more detail, as you can see. I'll leave that for a few seconds. As I said, one of the things I did want to finish off with is just a couple of tech tips. Why? Well, the whole point of having an appraisal toolkit is it's an electronic place to store the information that you need for your appraisal. But you need to put that information into it. And, and that's often where I think many GPs have difficulty. It's not that we're not doing the learning. It's the action element of recording it. And where can we get those learning um, information from? So obviously, in practice, we do lots of different things. Particularly over COVID, I'm pretty sure the amount of learning that every GP has done across the country probably tripled overnight. Um, I'm a big fan of things like podcasts and videos. I, I think they're a, a great way of learning because just reading text and trying to remember that doesn't work for everybody and podcasts in particular always been a big fan of I have my own um, but I think they're really good ways of trying to capture learning and if you want some, some examples some really good clinical ones feel free to have a look there if you're the type of person that likes having um, a way of sending information you've come across to somewhere to store and then refer back to it I really recommend a tool called Wakelet. Now you can use the booklet marklet technique I mentioned that it, it does exist in actually all the toolkits now. So both um, 14 Fish and GP Tools have a really good and simple book marklet to use. Clarity's isn't as well functioning, but it, but it does work. But the reason why I like Wakelet is that you can pretty much um, store any kind of information to a central place. And it's basically a tool that puts a little bookmark it on your browser or you can have it on your phone and it sends it to um, basically an RSS feed so it's like um, BBC News uh, page you create your own ticker in terms of the information you're storing and the real benefit of Wakelet is if you're doing this as a group of colleagues so for example when you finished your GP training and you've got a, a group of colleagues that you've been studying with and you want to keep that group mentality going you can share this learning really effectively so you can do that I guess within your practice you can do it within your locum groups whatever works best for you it's a really good way of sharing learning that you've come across and being able to basically do that really quickly and easily um, and you can use social media uh, loads of learning doesn't just happen through 
um, going off on and doing an e-learning and, and that kind of stuff. Actually, most of the effective learning I've done is through conversations with people. And actually, the way we have conversations nowadays is rapidly changing. It's becoming more digital. That can be through WhatsApp. That can be through Twitter. That can be through Facebook. There's loads of ways you can learn through that. So using social media to enhance the way that you learn things, and whether that's through discussions, whether that's through formal um, Twitter journal um, uh, events and that kind of stuff, whether it's through uh, tweet for example, that's, that's the, the long kind of Twitter feeds that you may sometimes see in things. Really good ways of trying to understand your learning and capturing that can be really easily done through using some of the methods I've met mentioned already. And finally, actually, if you don't like typing, well, talk. Some of the platforms, so particularly 14 Fish, has actually included um, speech to text into um, their toolkit. So you can you know, put audio as well as speech to text elements into it. But also, there are loads of apps and things that allow you to document things really easily. Even Google has its own one that allows this to work really well and things. So, you know, don't feel that you have to type everything, that you have to write everything, particularly if that's not what works for you. Find, there are really good tools that can help you do this a lot more naturally and, and, and in the way that works best for you. And if not, go off and create your own podcast for your appraiser to have a listen to. Be interesting to see how they respond to that. I know mine was interested. So that's what I've covered in this session. So why to use a toolkit and the current appraisal um, options are around um, and also comparison and some information on hopefully a few tech tips that will help you in terms of achieving your appraisal goals and making it just that little bit easier for yourself. I'm all done. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Dr. Gandalf. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box. And um, uh, Dr. Gandhi doesn't mind answering those in the chat. But we've also got a Q&A session right at the end. Um, if anyone wants to post their questions at the end, if they think of something later. Um, and I like the idea, if you if there isn't a podcast, start one yourself, which is exactly what you did. <laughs> so yeah, be a trailblazer. And if there isn't something that uh, suits your needs, look at uh, starting it yourself. I think it's a great way forward for our new and upcoming GPs. Okay, next we have Dr. Angela Sharma. Uh, she is a lead appraiser and she's going to be giving us an appraiser's view of the appraisal process. So a little bit about Dr. Sharman. Dr. Angela Sharman is a portfolio GP, very much so, and has a variety of clinical education and management roles. She's been an appraiser since 2008 and has been a locally lead appraiser in 2011. She has been a revalidation advisor for the RCGP and has provided national appraisal training on behalf of the revalidation support team. As well as that, her other roles include working as a sessional GP, as a GP locum and in out of hours work. She's a teaching fellow at the University of Nottingham, an associate dean for Health Education England, an examiner for the RCGP and is also a co-founder of GPS, which is a mentoring and coaching service for primary care. So an amazing example of a portfolio GP. Who said GP careers were boring? I'll hand over to you, Angela. Hi everyone, it's nice to, to be here. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen, so hopefully you should be able to see my slides. Okay, um, so I've just been asked to give an appraiser's view of appraisal, um, so that's what I'm planning to do. I'm going to have a look at what we're looking for um, when we're doing your appraisals, give you a few tips on how to ensure you have a smooth appraisal process, and I also thought I would show you the new um, 2020 appraisal template because I think there is a bit of fear and uncertainty about it, but actually it's it's really straightforward and easy. And I just thought if I showed it to you, it'd probably hopefully get rid of some of those anxieties that people described earlier on. Okay. So the first thing I thought I'd talk about is essentially how to keep your appraiser happy. Um, the first thing is get in touch with us and communicate with us. Um, it's really straightforward. We're not monsters. We're GPs just like the rest of you. And the idea is that all we want is an email from you saying, you know, let's organise your appraisal date. There's nothing more annoying when I get to my diary and, and you know, say your appraisal's in October and you contact me mid-October and my diary is completely full by that point because as Serena was saying, I've got millions of other roles um, and it's really then tough for me to slot in your appraisal. If you get in touch with me, you know, I don't know, a month or so before um, your appraisal date, you know, your appraisal month, it just means that we can sort out a date really easily that, that suits both of us. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say. And, it, and as Claire said, it is actually your 
more responsibility to um, to sort out your appraisal date. Um, so yeah, just have a think about that. You will get lots of reminders, automated reminders, and then they will hopefully all go away once, you, once you've done that, okay? Um, the other thing is sorting out um, when you're going to send your pre-appraisal information to us, um, you know, when you're gonna, you know, sign off your portfolio and things so that we can actually have access. I think the official guidance is two weeks, but again, you know, we can be flexible. I tend to look at the appraisal information a couple of days beforehand because otherwise I'll forget everything that I've read and, and I want to make sure that, you know, you know that I, I have read it and, and that I remember everything about you. So I generally personally will say actually a week beforehand is fine by me, but it will depend from appraiser to appraiser. So just have that conversation and check when it's going to be suitable. And most of us aren't going to get too sort of worried if it's a, you know, you need to negotiate a day here or there. That's not a, a big deal, but obviously we do need a bit of time to, to go through your portfolio. So just make sure that, that we get it really. Um, but communicate any issues early. Um, you know, we will be flexible and we will, you know, we get that everyone's busy, that we've all got lots of responsibilities. Um, and if you communicate with us, we will try to be flexible and try and work around what you need as well. Um, I have on one occasion, I think, accepted appraisal information on the morning of the appraisal that I was supposed to be doing that afternoon. But that was basically because the doctor had really kept me, me informed of what was going on with him and he was having a bit of a tough time. And I was like, okay, that's fine. But if, if you hadn't communicated with that with me and I'd got that information that morning, I might have been quite cross because actually it wouldn't give me much time to, to prepare. So it's just thinking about some of those issues. OK, so my big message is communicate a bit like Claire said to stay in touch with the appraisal office, stay in touch with your appraiser. And, and we can also give you tips and hints sometimes, you know, if you're looking for information, and you're not quite sure how to put something forward or you're, you're looking for a template or something. You know, most of us have been doing it for quite a while and we often have a little folder of those things and I can send stuff to you if, if that's what you need or links or information. So, you know, use us. That's what we're there for. OK, pre-appraisal preparation. Well, Gandhi's already gone through um, quite a lot of um, the stuff in the toolkits. I would really recommend using one of the commercial toolkits. I've used um, two of the different toolkits and I've used MAG because I've one year I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do use this because it's free. So I'll give it a go. Um, and personally, I found MAG a bit of a pain. Um, it only opens on certain servers. You can't actually attach as it's got sort of quite limited. Um, you're only allowed a certain number of attachments. Um, so it's, it's quite limited in what you can attach to it, which meant that I ended up having to send loads of stuff by email to my appraiser, which was a pain for me and a pain for them. Um, and on occasions when I've been an appraiser, it can be a bit tricky to, sign, to, to actually do the sign off. Um, so personally, as a, as a doctor doing appraisals um, and also as an appraiser doing appraisals, um, I would really strongly recommend using one of the commercial toolkits. And then you do have all the, all the added benefits of things like the PSQ and the MSF are built into the toolkits and, and they're generally updated more easily as well. So um, it's just easier to, to they're set up better really. I think it is worth, if you've never had an appraisal before, or even if you have had an appraisal and things have changed like they have this year, it's really worth having a look through the guidance that's available. Um, so Claire's already signposted you to some stuff on the on various websites. There's a lot of information on the on the Royal College of GPs website, and also our responsible officers um, do write out to all doctors in the area, you know, fairly regularly. And I've certainly got a little folder of those letters just so that when I do actually need it, um, I can actually go and refer to it and think, okay, well, what's he saying that I need to do for, sh you know, and make sure I meet all the minimum requirements. But if you're not sure, if it's your first appraisal, it's absolutely fine to ask. Um, the appraisal team are incredibly helpful and responsive, but also, you know, you can ask your appraiser, it's not a problem. And I would really, really reiterate Claire's message about, think about what you want to get out of the appraisal. This is your time, okay? How often do you get a chance to sit down with another colleague uninterrupted for a couple of hours, okay? Use that time and use it effectively. If you've done everything you need to do for the portfolio, I can do all that preparation beforehand. I do not need to go and talk about it all over again, unless there's something you want to talk about about your portfolio. Actually use that time to have a conversation that's going to be helpful professionally or personally for you. And I've had all sorts of conversations with doctors that I've appraised. Um, I've helped somebody negotiate contracts. Um, they were salaried and they were getting a new contract. They wanted some advice about how to negotiate um, that with their employers. Um, I've spoken to people about how they manage time, you know, their work-life balance. Um, I've spoken to somebody who was having a really tough time with a coroner's court case and they wanted some advice and I've been through it. So we had a chat about that and thought about ways that we could prepare. Um, we've talked about trying to negotiate changes in work patterns. So there was a partner who wanted to drop a session and we kind of had a practice run through how they might, you know, manage that conversation in the partner's meeting. 
you know, you've got a peer who's generally quite experienced and is willing to be there. You know, they've signed up to be an appraiser for a reason. It's because they enjoy having those conversations and they enjoy, you know, supporting colleagues because that's how I see an appraisal. It's not, I don't want it all to be a tick box exercise. I want it to be something that's going to be useful to the people that I'm appraising. Um, so make use of us. And certainly I would say that my attitude towards appraisal has been really um it's been set by the appraisals that I had early on in my career. Um, and I had incredibly supportive appraisers. You know, a lot of the work that I do now is based on suggestions that were made at my own personal appraisals. Um, and I can remember when I was going through a really tough time after we'd had a family bereavement and I actually hadn't worked for a few months. Having my appraisal was really positive for me and they really helped me see my way forward. So, so I, I just think make use of us, okay? We're not scary, we're here to support you. In terms of what we're looking for, um, it's not that hard. Essentially, we want you to engage. You know, we want you to have actually done something on the e-portfolio and we want some evidence of reflection. So it's not just I've been to this course, I've done this, I've done that. Well, what have you done with that information? You know, have you just sat in a, in a lecture theatre or have you just sat through a podcast and that's it? You've just spent the time and nothing has changed. I'm not going to be that impressed with that. But if actually you say, you know what, it made me think about how things work in my practice and maybe I drew up a new protocol or I went and had a chat with the nurses about how they do something, or maybe actually I changed how I spoke to a patient, um, or maybe I, I thought differently about the questions I asked them. That's the sort of evidence of reflection that I'm wanting to see. And I would definitely say that quality trumps quantity. I'm not interested in seeing hundreds of, certificate of certificates because that's not really any evidence that anything's changed or that you've, you've actually developed um, professionally. What I actually want to see is that you're you're thinking about what you're learning and you're thinking about how you're working. OK, that's all it comes down to. That's really all we want to see. As a couple of people have alluded to already this year, um, there's been a new medical appraisal template developed um, and essentially that's in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's basically national recognition that any doctor that's in clinical practice will have met any minimum requirements for CPD and quality improvement activity. So essentially they've been taken out of the discussions. Um, it's also an attempt to reduce appraisal re preparation time, which is it's been going on for a while that, but this is sort of really trying to make sure that that's nailed down because what we don't want to do is have people spending, you know, a day or two days um, putting their portfolios together this, at the moment. We, we just don't have the time for that, most of us. Um, and apparently national pilots with this new form have shown that actually people are managing to fill it in within about half an hour. So hopefully it's not going to be really onerous on you. And there's very much a focus on well-being and support. We know that for a lot of doctors, the COVID pandemic has been really quite challenging on lots of levels, not just in the work um, that they're doing, but also, um, you know, just personally, you know, the sort of the juggling of home and life, the impacts, not seeing family or having family around suddenly a lot more than you would necessarily have had if your kids have been around. So we just want this to be a really supportive conversation um, and a chance for you to actually sit back and reflect and think about how it's affected you, but also how are you going to plan to move forward with, with everything that's been going on? Okay. And then this is just a, a copy of the form. So I'm actually just going to stop sharing and get the actual form up. So bear with me one second. Uh, here we go. So this is just a copy of the form. And I just thought I would share it with you just so you can see it's actually really quite straightforward. Okay. So let me move that out of the way. So essentially, first bit is just pop in your personal details, put in your GMC number and talk about the scope of your work. Now, you need to describe every single role that involves you having a license to practice. So all of your GP roles, anything else that is involved, um, you know, so if you're working in a private company that does aesthetics, if you're a, um, helping in a hospital doing clinical sessions there, if you're a volunteer, but the reason you volunteer, you know, you're the doctor of your, you know, your child's gym club. The only reason you're able to do that voluntary role as a doctor for the gym club is because you have a license to practice. So anything that involves your license to practice needs to be included in your scope of work. OK, and if you're a locum, you need to make sure that you have a list of every single practice that you've worked at. OK, this is probably I'm just trying to give tips on things that often get missed or people don't realise. Um, so, yeah, so it's just having that list. I don't need to know the dates and wherever you locumed. Just any local practice that you've locumed at in the last 12 months, just pop it on under scope of work. OK. In terms of PDP review, hopefully you will all have a PDP from the previous year. If you're an ST3 trainee, ideally you should have set a PDP for what you were going to do in your first year of practice. And essentially we're just going to have a little look at that and we want you to reflect on what you've achieved, 
were there any that you weren't able to achieve if so why not um and you know what was the most useful thing for you what what did you get out of your your pdp was it helpful or did it end up changing and we also recognize that you know covid has had a massive impact so don't worry if you haven't hit every single target that's absolutely fine you know the pdp when you set it is just at a specific moment in time and sometimes goalposts change okay and then I think these are really key questions. We'd like you to think about, you know, what have been the challenges for you in the last year? What have been your achievements in the last year? Because I think too, all too often we just think about all the negatives and we don't actually think about all the amazing things that we've done. But also, what are your aspirations? What are you thinking about doing going forward? OK, and I think those are all really useful things for you to be discussing um, with your appraiser. OK, this is new for this year um, and which we're being asked to, to sort of mark down our personal professional well-being how are we feeling at the moment and actually talking a little bit about how covid has affect has affected us personally okay and then if you have got any information that you want to submit about you know if there is any cpd that's been particularly relevant or useful if there's been any sort of activity that you've done that you've been particularly proud of or anything that you would like to discuss but you don't have to put everything in okay so just think about things that you particularly want to discuss at your appraisal all right and then obviously, if there have been any significant events or complaints, that still does, that is still a GMC requirement. We do, do still need you to declare them, okay? And if anybody's asked you to bring anything to your appraisal, now this is normally people who've been through some sort of performance management issue, um, but if anything's be, if you've been asked to bring anything to your appraisal, that's that needs to go in as well. And then the last thing is just thinking about your PDP. What are your goals? What are you hoping to achieve over the next year, okay? And I would strongly encourage you to think about that um, before you meet the appraiser, okay? Um, we have to have a PDP. At the, outs at the end of our meeting, there needs to be some sort of PDP written down. And I can always come up with stuff. That's not a problem. I can make all sorts of suggestions for you. But it's much better if you come up with your own PDP because you're actually much more likely to achieve it. And it's more likely to be relevant and helpful to you, okay? So that's all the form is. That's all you're being expected to do this year, end of. And basically, these forms have been incorporated into all of the appraisal toolkits. Um, so it's there. You can just click a button. It'll tell you, you know, which, you know, if, if you want to put in your old previous appraisal information, you can do. If you just want to fill in this form, you can do. So it's really quite straightforward. And that's essentially all I needed to, to talk about. So, yeah, that, that was it for my, for my slides. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Angela. That was really, really useful. And um, I always say I think of my appraiser as a GP career advisor, essentially, and you're there to help guide GPs looking ahead towards their career. And you really benefit from it when you change your mindset from your training portfolio mindset, which is a bit more kind of completing the necessary boxes and making sure you've met all the competencies to now owning it and your your appraisal is there for you to use to help you plan your career ahead so I always think of my appraiser as a as a career advisor as well brilliant so uh, again if you've got any questions feel free to pop them in the chat box um, but we'll move on next to Dr Rachel Jani Shusky um, and she is an appraise, she's going, she's done her first appraisal. So she's going to tell us about what it's like to be an appraisee and um, what it's like to go through your first appraisal. Um, Dr. Rachel completed her GP training in 2018 and she now works as a salary GP. Um, she's also an education tutor with the Nottinghamshire Phoenix programme, new to practice scheme. Uh, and she's been doing that since August, 2019. She previously completed a GP fellowship with the Nottinghamshire Alliance Training Hub, focusing on education and frailty. And she has completed a postgraduate certificate in medical education from the University of Nottingham. So she's already done a lot, two years since uh, qualifying. So well done, Dr. Rachel. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Zarina. I need to share my screen. Um... Oh, thanks, James. So I think we're going to start with another a mentee poll, if that's OK. So um, for those that um, joined a bit late to the um, kind of the presentation, the, um, if you type in the code, go to mentee.com, um, be good to get everyone's idea. So is this your first appraisal? And if you've done one before, how did the last one go? So if everyone can log in and do that.
Yep, sorry, I totally forgot to, uh, <laughs> to do that, Rachel. So, yeah, go on to uh, menti.com, brilliant, and uh, enter that code. And it looks like most of it is first. Mm, brilliant. Which is good. Brilliant. So I think there'd be a little bit of a mixture, but it seems like most people, it's their first appraisal or haven't even, um, it will be their first or they've only just done one. Yeah. Um, so hopefully the tips I'm going to mention might be quite useful. I think they'll be useful even to those of us that have done a few appraisals. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks. Do you want to go ahead, Rachel? Yeah, perfect. Do you want Thank me to share my pair? Thanks, James. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. But we will put it down. So thank you for everyone joining this um, seminar tonight. So, um, yeah, as Sabrina said, I'm Rachel, salary GP and also work at the Nottinghamshire programme. So I'm going to cover um, mainly appraisal and early career. So I did my first appraisal back in June 2019. Um, I missed my appraisal this year because of COVID. So, um, Although the new appraisal is obviously different to what we had to do before, the basics and the premises base is the same. Um, so we're going to cover kind of preparing for your appraisal, what to prepare and what to expect. Um, how to declare and Angela particularly, there's going to be quite a lot of repetition, I think, in what I'm going to be saying. So apologies, um, but hopefully the message will go in more. So the main thing um, I would recommend is don't worry. Remember the purpose appraisal. It's not pass fail, it's a supportive meeting now more than ever. Um, the aims of appraisal are to help plan professional development, identify your learning needs and demonstrate and remain up to date and fit to practice. So it's there um, to kind of help you, not kind of fail you basically. So the next thing I would say is make sure you have a look at the toolkits and the appraisal process early. Angela's already run through kind of what we need to do for the next appraisal, the kind of one post-COVID. But once you've chosen a toolkit, just have a look, enter any easy personal details and just look what you might need to kind of log or require. The next thing I'd say, as Angela said before, include the whole scope of work. So clinical work, any portfolio working, education, project work, locum work. Um, I'll touch on how COVID particularly has impacted on these different roles if you've got different roles um, in your appraisal. Um, that'll be a good discussion point. Um, next thing, ask for help if you need it. So we've had this um, kind of workshop tonight. Um, you can discuss with colleagues and friends, um, contact things like the Nottinghamshire Phoenix Programme, the Derby GP Task Force Scheme, um, previously, I've been involved in appraisal sessions um, with the Nottingham Phoenix programme, um, which have been really kind of well attended and great feedback. And during those sessions, we've often um, shared our appraisals. Um, so kind of small groups and had a look at kind of how the appraisal works and kind of, um, kind of more hands-on, which have been really useful in the past for everyone. And I'm sure next year kind of in the new year the phoenix program and, and probably the gp task force might have similar sessions on in the future so kind of look out for that um as angela said organize date time early it is your responsibility to arrange um just to get it in the diary um you should have received an email from the appraisal and revalidation team if you haven't obviously email them to kind of 
you on their radar. Um, it sounds like the appraisal is going to be virtually rather than face to face now. So make sure obviously clarify how you're going to actually have the appraisal with your appraiser. So the next thing to think, think about is also, it's not as onerous as joint training. It is only about half an hour kind of um, preparation that you need to do, which is far, far, far less than what you need to do for VTS training. After completing VTS, you should be probably an expert in reflection. So remember all those skills in kind of reflecting um, and make sure it's kind of quality over quantity. Think of your reflections as like a good way for your appraiser to get to know you, because this might be the first time that you've ever met them. Um, and it's kind of get to know you a little bit more before you meet. And then you can base your discussions on kind of things that you've written in your appraisal. And just so that you've kind of, they've got to know you a bit before you've even met. So, so more top tips about prepayable. So I've been through the um, appraisal checklist like Andrew just um, gave us a summary. So PDP, do transfer that from your trainee portfolio um, before you possibly lose access to VT, VTS portfolio as well. Due to COVID especially, more than understandable if not achieved or your PDP has changed. So putting it on there can, as a discussion point. The next one, the challenges, achievements, aspirations. This looks like to be a key reflection area for the portfolio. So encourage to talk about these topics and they will form the basis of your appraisal meeting. Um, personal and professional well-being. On Clarity Toolkit, it says it's not mandatory, but I would write a reflection on this as it has been a challenging time working during COVID pandemic. So I would encourage you to write something on that part. Sporting information, such as CPD learning events. If you've already attended CPD events, I'd log them, teaching, any compliments, um, any kind of key learning kind of events, basically. I'd log on to this section, although it's not mandatory. Um, it's also a good record and log of things that you've learned to remind you of key learning points. I would open up and reflect on any ones that you do that you might want to actually discuss with the appraiser if it was particularly useful or might lead a discussion. Significant events only if we've reached GMC th level threshold. So nearly most most of us probably won't have any of those. So it's not significant events that you would normally bring to the um, like a significant event meeting in your practice they would go in the learning events. Complaints, so you have to log those. And then, like Angela said, make sure you propose a PDP, otherwise you probably will get given one or you'll have a um, discussion about um, what your PDP will be. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, during the appraisal, try not to be intimidated. The appraiser will have a lot of experience and likely to have a very interesting career or um, different things they're doing. Use this to your advantage rather than being put off. So um, it's a two-way conversation that you're having and actually it might match up with some things that you might want to possibly get involved with in the future. So tap into them as a resource as well as it being kind of obviously a meeting that you have to have. The appraisal is a time for each GP to sit down in a safe, protected environment and reflect on the last 12 months or longer, depending on if you've missed your first appraisal. The meeting can take a variety of different avenues and be guided by what you input in the appraisal and what you want to talk about. Um, the opportunity for appraiser to sign posts and facilitate discussion about your future and career planning. Um, after the appraisal, you have time to review what the appraiser has put in your appraisal accept the comments and that's within 28 days. So um, make sure you have to log in back into your appraisal after you've had your meeting. Um, so that's my top tips really, is a kind of um, main thing is don't worry, ask questions if you're not sure, either to the appraisal team, your appraiser, colleagues, program, GP task force, 
um, and just prepare early, my main points. Any questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel, so much. I think it's really helpful um, to have those little nuggets sometimes and just break it down into top tips um, of important things to remember. So that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank um, you. If there are any questions, I know we've been answering some in the chat boxes as you've been talking. If there aren't any more questions, then we'll go on to introduce Gail. So um, we've got Dr. Gail Walton here. She is uh, the Executive Director of Derbyshire GP Task Force and Derby and Derbyshire LMC. Um, uh, the new De Director of the New to Practice Programme, a GP partner, a GP appraiser, and a GPS mentor as well. And she's just going to tell us a little bit about the um, GP Partnership New to Practice Scheme. So over to you, Gail. Thanks very much, Serena, and good evening to everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is a very quick reminder, really, to everybody um, to get in contact with us if you need to know more about the New to Practice GP scheme. You may well be aware that this is um, coming through for GPs and also New to Practice um, nurses. But of course, I want to focus on the GP scheme tonight. Um, like I say, it's available to everybody who's recently CCT'd, and it's a chance to get backfill monies to support you if you are in a substantive role as a GP. So by substantive, we mean salaried or partnership roles or portfolio roles then you are entitled to apply, get back fill, pay to your employee so that they can release you for this, this scheme. If I can have the next slide, uh, it will just tell you a little bit about how you can access information and what this scheme's about. So it's pro rata and it can sometimes make it sound a little bit complicated but you get pro rata, the equivalent of a full session um, a week off if you were a nine session a week. So yes, uh, there's reimbursement based on a sessional rate of £7,200 per annum, pro rata down, which would go to your employer to uh, release you to uh, take advantage of the scheme, which really falls under three headings. Um, support and mentorship, development and learning, and PCN portfolio experience and working. So the things that are vital to us as GPs in our career development at any stage, but this is a real opportunity to, to grasp that. Gemma Wilkinson is my colleague who heads up the scheme in Nottinghamshire as part of the Phoenix programme. And similarly, I do the same in Derbyshire in the GP task force. So read the guidance, give us a ring in our offices and we'll email you back and arrange to have a phone conversation about your entitlement to these roles and, and support. That's my advert pretty much finished. If I can just have the next slide, that would be great. That's the link to the, the, the document that outlines the whole context of the scheme. But well, get in touch, talk to us, um, get the real benefits of what's available to you as you CCT and join practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. I would really encourage uh, Nottingham and Derbyshire GPs to check those out. And if you're a Lincoln based GP, um, if you go onto the Lincoln, LMC website, then um, they also have some support schemes available for new to practice GPs. Okay, so uh, we've been answering some questions um, in the chat box as we've gone along. Um, one thing we'll do now is we'll run the, um, let's run the Mentimeter um, to see if you're all still with us and um, to see how you feel about appraisals now. I'm scared. Brilliant. Buzz oh, someone's still buzzing and someone's still excited. Fantastic. So we haven't um, uh, kind of driven you the other way. 
Brilliant. Reassurance, understanding it much better. Know what to expect. Simpler than expected. Absolutely. I think sometimes we can, you know, there's a lot of, um, you can often think something's quite complicated when you don't really know much about it. Um, so good, more aware, reassured, fantastic. Great, thank you so much for engaging in that. Um, you can keep entering words in there if you would like to. Um, we'll, um, we'll take any questions if there are any more questions, if you want to pop them in the um, chat box. I was just going to give Claire an opportunity to answer one that was posted earlier in person. So um, all the speakers can have their videos and audios back on. Um, it was about the um, MSF and PSQs, um, about elaborating on the benchmark for MSF and PSQs. So Claire, I just wondered if you wanted to answer that in person as well. Um, I'm sure that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah no worries. So uh, with your MSF PSQs, if you use a um, one that's attached to your toolkit or a uh, survey company, so Edgecombe, uh, CFEP are the common ones that are used in the area. Um, then once you reach a certain response level, then they automatically benchmark them for you. So your responses are compared to everybody else that has used, for example, CFEP or uh, Clarity or whatever. And um, there are some of those toolkits will do it by area or by via um, specialty, so GP or GP locum. So you can look at how you compare uh, across a number of different aspects. So it's, um, it, it's as long as you basically get the number of respondents you need, it will be benchmarked for you. So it takes a, a lot of stress out of it. Brilliant, thank you so much, Claire. Um, any other questions to do with appraisals, to do with what you've heard this evening? Um, I think most of the others have been um, answered. Oh, there was one about how can we contact the appraisal team? I know Claire had a slide. So this event I is being forwarded. Oh, and Angela. In the chat as oh, well. yes. Perfect. So it depends where you where you work, but Angela's very kindly popped the email address for GPs who are based in the Midlands. Um, right, another question. MSF PSQ once per revalidation cycle. Uh, yes, is the short answer. <laughs> Every five years. Um, question okay, was sent brilliant. Through, one question was sent through, perhaps for Claire, um, is that for PSQs and MSFs at the moment when we're doing everything um, uh, remotely, is now a good time to do it, or um, would it might might be better to see how things go over the coming months and have a maybe a higher fidelity response? Yeah, in, in all honesty, I would say now probably isn't a good time because you, even if you feel that you can do it, then your colleagues may not uh, feel up to answering questions at the moment. You're probably not seeing patients face to face, which will make it a lot more difficult. Um, in all honesty, I would probably wait. Um, anyone whose revalidation is due or has been due this year, the revalidation date's been rolled forward for 12 months. So you should be able to get another appraisal in, hopefully, before that. If you can't, it, it doesn't matter. All that it will mean is that we will put through a deferral, which will give you time to get that MSF or PSQ done. Um, and then, you know, we, it could go through your appraisal and then we can make a recommendation after that. I would say, do not worry about it, you know. But I would say now probably might not be the best time to be doing it. And there's another query about revalidate another question question about revalidation um, for this year with the CB, CPT requirement not be counted. I think would that be I think they mean not included for revalidation yeah. this year. So as yeah, so the the GMC have never said um, that there had to be a certain amount of CPD. The RCGP of of uh, putting limits every now and then. And the ROs previously have said that they wanted a specific amount of CPD. That isn't required anymore. So we will not be looking saying you haven't done 50 CPD, you haven't done 250 CPD over your validation period. So um, you just need to be demonstrating that you, you're actually doing enough CPD 
to uh, keep you up to date. So, and, and I think that that is probably quite difficult to do and it will be something that we're all gonna have to get used to. Um, but for revalidation, it, it doesn't matter, especially for this year. Thank you, Claire. And there's another one I'll put to you. I think I know the answer, but I, I will put it to you. For the PSQs, if it's been done in GP training within that revalidation period, do you need to complete a further PSQ as a qualified GP or does the one that you've done in your GP training count? So if for an MSF PSQ, if you've done them during your training, they will not count. Uh, that's because when you did them, you were under supervision. Um, when you uh, come to be revalidated this time, you'll be doing it as a fully qualified doctor. And so the responses you get may be slightly different. And so, yes, you, you can't use your training one. It would need to be a different one. Great. Thank you so much. OK, any more questions? There was a no. question. No, OK, so... Oh. There was a question for Gail about um, whether um, during they had to rotate around um, during the um, during the fellowships from Anne and Jarvis. Um, do you have to do you have to rotate around practices that are part of this, or are you just based at one place? So the answer to that is no. You're going to be in a substantive post, so you're going to be, for example, a salary GP in one practice. Or you may have a PCN post. Let's keep it simple. You're a salary GP in one post. In the second year of the scheme, there's encouragement for you to experience what's happening in your PCN area at a different sort of level. So you may well do some work within the PCN area. But it may well be, because what we've got to remember is that not many of us are full-time GPs. So the amount of time is actually going to be quite small. So it's really supporting you to get experience of what's happening locally. And that may be going and sitting in different, it's make, I'll make it sound boring, but sitting in different meetings, committees, networking with people you might not otherwise get a chance to. Some of that may involve you in some clinical oversight somewhere along the line, but it's really the opportunity for you to just see what's out in your area, make those networks, make the connections, know who's doing what. Thank you, Gail. OK, well, I think we'll call it an evening there. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us this evening and for your questions and for engaging with our Mentimeter surveys. I'd like to thank all of our speakers this evening. They've all volunteered their time. They're all exceptionally busy GPs who do umpteen amounts of things as well as general practice. So a big thank you to um, Dr. Gandhi, Dr. Angela Sharma, Dr. Rachel Janiszewski and Dr. Gail Walton. Um, thanks to Claire Gooder as well um, for giving your expert advice about um, the appraisal and revalidation process. We really, it's been really helpful having you here um, to instantly answer the questions and, and tell us about appraisals. And also a thank you to uh, Dr. James Waldron, who's been in the background running the IT side of things and manning the, um, the slides and the survey. So thanks very much again for volunteering your time. There will be a uh, feedback form going out after this event. Please do fill that in. It's really helpful for us to hear what you found worked well and what we could improve on. And um, there's also the option there for you to tell us um, about what future events you'd like us to cover. So topics, whether that's educational topics or, or something else. So please do fill it in. We really um, uh, value your feedback. And I think we'll say thank you and good evening. <laughs>